Hi, today we're going to talk about um, agriculture and uh, rural development in Azerbaijan. And my guest is Sara Zaiva. Hi, Sara. Hello. Sara, could you introduce yourself to our audience, please? Hello, my name is Sara Rezaeva. I have received my MS and PhD in global development from Cornell University. And um, my research involves rural Azerbaijan's um, development in the post-Soviet period. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. Um, I listened to your presentation recently at uh, Oxford University, uh, where you were presenting um, your thoughts um, uh, at, uh, it was one of the um, seminar series on Azerbaijan, um, and it is it was named Human uh, Beyond the Boom uh, towards Social and Human Development in Post Oil Era Azerbaijan. Uh, I found fascinating, um, you know, the ideas, thoughts, observations, and suggestions you made. So, um, this is why we're doing this interview now. Could you tell us, please, um, what is the role of agriculture in the economy of Azerbaijan right now? Yes. Um, Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan has had an agricultural press under the Soviet Union. And um, although our oil was strategic to the World War II, during the World War II to the USSR, Azerbaijan and the USSR have been predominantly agricultural. In the post-Soviet period, as we reintegrated into the global economy and um, oil exports became strategic, agriculture nevertheless um, has remained as a sector which employs a majority of people in the country. So uh, agricultural employment accounts for about 40% of the labor force um, uh, in Azerbaijan in the post-Soviet period. However, the sector's importance has dropped to um, during the, in the post-Soviet period, but agriculture is strategic for Azerbaijan as a sector which employs most of the um, labor force. Yeah, so um, what is the percentage of uh, employment? How many Azerbaijanis are employed in um, yeah, an agricultural sector? Um, about 40% of the uh, of Azerbaijan's labor force is registered as employed in agriculture, and about 50% of Azerbaijan's population is uh, registered in the statistics, state statistics as a rural population. So about that is uh, that is about yeah for about four million people. Yeah, and. And what is, uh, what is a percentage of, you know, uh, agriculture, uh, agriculture shares in GDP right now? And how much it was in Soviet Union, maybe? Um, during Azerbaijan's transition, as the economy um, capitalized on oil, the share of mining and industry in the GDP rose and the share of the agriculture dropped. Between 1995, and 2006, the share of the agriculture in GDP in Azerbaijan dropped between about 25% to around 6% of the GDP. Nevertheless, the sector continues to employ um, most of the country's uh, labor force. Still, uh, the employment in agriculture remained, but the importance of agriculture in the GDP declined comparing to the industry, or specifically oil. Yeah. Do, uh, what is... Um... What is the strategy of Azerbaijani government? Could you explain us, since you have been analyzing this, researching this, um, is this, um, what, what is strategies on food security or uh, self, how does it, does, it, does it deal with self-sufficiency versus expert promotion? You know, what is, uh, where, where does the government wants to take, in your view, from your observation, the agriculture, uh, of Azerbaijan? Azerbaijanian government, um, based on the legal decrees and the programs, development programs uh, over the last 15 years, prioritizes both rural development and food security. So um, 
since 2000, since 2004, 2004, 2008 was the beginning of the first state program on the de development of the rural regions and significant reinvestment of capital um, was directed to the development of rural regions. Um, about 1.8 million jobs were created in the countryside. And um, this was taking place after the land redistribution. So in the post-Soviet period, Azerbaijan decollectivized former Soviet and um, so Soviet state and collective farms and redistributed the land to individual owners. And in the same period, and Azerbaijan also prioritizes the development of small and medium-sized enterprises, small and medium-sized farming in the countryside, which is uh, in the international economic model, small farming has been shown to be, um, has been argued to be a more, uh, um, more productive model, although this is debated, but it's been argued to be more productive. It provides labor um, to the rural population. And we have emphasized, our government have emphasized small and medium ownership in the countryside. Um, there are different types of enterprises in rural Azerbaijan after the land reforms. Some people cultivate their lands individually. Um, some type of uh, farms, they're known as peasant family farms. They, 95% of these uh, category, peasant family farms, they're operating on lease inland. Some of them lease in um, the land uh, from others' land, individual land shares, and um, they operate, um, they produce vegetables. Other, and then we have uh, large farms and specifically orchards that are capital, capital intensive. And um, the number of these have also increased in the recent, recent years. Azerbaijan also prioritized food security and food self-sufficiency. And um, the documents, uh, the, the post-Soviet uh, programs focusing on food sufficiency go back to 2001. President Haider Aliyev signed the first uh, uh, program on the food security of Azerbaijan. The latest one is the one from 2019 to 2025, the recent one. It specifically emphasizes um, production of Azerbaijan. It, it lists uh, data on the self-sufficiency level of Azerbaijan. And we have remarkable level of self-sufficiency across different food products. And um, in some of the products such as vegetables, we are producing more than 100% uh, volume of, that's worth more than 100% of domestic needs. So Azerbaijan's, uh, uh, Azerbaijan's agricultural production is sufficient to meet its domestic needs. With regards to uh, export production, and now which part of this is directed to export, which part of it uh, is within the country. The statistics do not provide clear cut uh, um, data, but Azerbaijan in the policy, the self-sufficiency is a main priority. So if push comes to show the country is producing, um, the, is producing the amount necessary for its population. But we are sharing Russia is an important agricultural export market for Azerbaijan. Many of Azerbaijan's small, medium-sized, large-sized enterprises um, are exporting its produce to Russia. Are, is there, um, you know, with, with export promotion, sometimes some countries are focusing just on planting one, uh, you know, um, uh, something, some, some one uh, product for export and and it, it may have, uh, it may lead to certain problems like, you know, in Ecuador, you know, when Ecuador was planting uh, just coffee because, you know, the, the market uh, was saying this and demanding this. So they were just focused on coffee. It led to certain problems um, with, you know, was the deterioration of, of the land. The, and then it was uh, the dependency just on one. Um, on one product, uh, the, 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 the prices, you know, could drop and it would have immense uh, impact on, on economy in Ecuador. Does, when you talk about agriculture, I mean, does Azerbaijan focus on some product too much? Do you see such dangers or, or in Azerbaijan we have quite balanced, you know, policy in regarding of producing, you know, 
plans to fall for, for export? Thank you very much for your question. This is actually a very important point. The experience of the global economy in terms of food production and the use of agriculture for development of individual economies and how it can be used for Azerbaijan is an important point. Um, since uh, so since 19, since the middle of the 20th century, the world food production has seen a dramatic increase in yields due to introduction of uh, new agricultural technologies, specifically fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, partially known as green revolution. And um, from 1970s onwards, partially fueled by the um, global debt crisis, um, major model uh, uh, just uh, taken by um, many countries around the world has been export production. However, um, the ability and the possibilities um, of uh, the possibility to achieve sustainable development via export agriculture is um, questionable. Uh, export production. Number, there are several reasons for that. There are several several reasons for that. Um, as you mentioned, the example of Ecuador and uh, the the examples can be added. Um, during the, um, the dependence of the, the current industrial agricultural model with which many of the countries in the world are producing main foodstuffs, that is a model based um, on um, external inputs, as I've mentioned, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides. And although the genetic modification have been added as a way to remedy, it is not, um, um, it shares one quality with the previous models, and that is um, dependency on the companies that produce these inputs. And the GM also means dependency on the companies that manufacture these seeds. So um, at the end of the day, um, an agricultural production model that is uh, based on external inputs also means an uh, um, dependency for the farmers on these inputs and the sharing of the profits with the companies producing these inputs. Also, in the, the, markets, the markets into which uh, these uh, agricultural products are being exported, um, the openness of these markets is not the same under the current uh, World Trade Organization rules. So, and the entry into the market, there are in the global food industry agricultural markets um, are known by what is called bottlenecks. So the large corporations control, um, control or mediate the ex exchanges between a very large number of farmers and large number of company, uh, customers. But there is there are a small number of very large corporations that uh, yield massive amounts of power over uh, um, what is being sold, how, and what are the prices. And so um, the entry of many of the third world country, developing countries into the global arena after 1970s and declining food uh, has meant declining prices for the farmers, direct producers. What um, there is also there are also concerns about whether export agriculture goes with the self sufficiency. Now imagine this: imagine a country producing, I will say, for example, apples, and um, there is a particular year and. Um, of drought and uh, the prices for food items go high up. Research shows that in an economy that is oriented towards export agriculture in this type of circumstances, when there are droughts and climatic difficulties and uh, the ability to purchase, um, uh, to purchase can may diminish locally and there can be a market for the items externally, um, there have been an actually increase in the outflow of food products from countries at the time of need. So export agriculture um, has, been sh has been connected to actually um, exacerbating the, uh, the distribution of food locally, the problems with the distribution of food locally and may result in um, outflow of food items at the time of difficulty. So there are these, um, there are these aspects associated with export agriculture. Azerbaijan's, um, Azerbaijan prioritizes self-sufficiency. One of the 
crops, um, most uh, one of the uh, crops accounting for most of the total sown land area in Azerbaijan is wheat. Most of it is produced by individual farmers in Azerbaijan, small farmers. And um, the Chan we do, Azerbaijan has, produces about almost 100%, 99.5% of its own grain needs. Um, the question um, for Azerbaijan is not that we are, we are fortunate with land resources, we're fortunate with labor resources to produce food sufficient for the domestic needs. But the question standing before Azerbaijan is how to um, bypass the negative effects of industrial agriculture, how to combine household level self-sufficiency with um, sustainability and uh, production that enhances land that uh, does not have the negative effects of industrial agriculture. I, I wanted actually, Sarah, to ask you this question about, you know, we all know about uh, fertilizer companies, uh, that they are very powerful, they are global. In America, they have, uh, you know, they're lobbying very heavily their interests, you know, in US and also globally. They come to, you know, countries like Azerbaijan and push their way through uh, presenting, you know, their strategies as the best strategies, as the ones that actually helps the country, helps the economy. Um, could you tell us how much Azerbaijan is using, you know, uh, you know, fertilizers uh, in reality, and how was the trend there? How what what is the government's policy in regard to this specific issue? Yes, um, if we look at the World Bank data on world economic indicators, we will see an increase in the use of fertilizer per hectare in Azerbaijan over the last. Um, 10 years or so, um, the um, amount of fertilizers used per hectare in Azerbaijan have gone up from nine kilograms per hectare to 60 kilograms per hectare. But this is not something that is um, under direct control of government. Because I, as I said, the agriculture in Azerbaijan operates very much with small, medium uh, farm enterprises. So this is something that the farmers are doing. Um, there is an aspect that you mentioned, yes. Foreign companies often uh, um, come and market their solutions as uh, the only way, as a quick gain, and uh, something that will um, benefit the farmers. At the end of the day, once farmers start um, using these fertilizers, they find out that it's a downward spiral. They need to use more and more, and the model doesn't really prevent soil degradation. So, uh, Sarah, there is, this, there, is this ch there is this choice between uh, organic farming and uh, conventional, uh, organic growth and conventional growth. And um, can you tell us, I mean, what does the data say? I mean, can you give us example of the country which took the path of organic farming versus a country which took this road you know, uh, of uh, more conventional growth and, you know, what happens? I mean, so m maybe we could uh, have an idea about what paths could lead to in what direction. Yes, and thank you very much for the question. This is a very important question. The challenge start uh, standing before food production globally in the world, actually, it's not really just the difference between industrial farming and organic farming. The main task is how to ensure um, nutritionally better quality food and yes, organic is an example of that while maintaining and developing soil quality and ensuring uh, that these practices are sustainable into the future. And um, one of the models um, that has been recently discovered and it, well, it's been the, the research on it have been going on for quite some time. But one of the models that is recently being discussed is called agroecology, and this is um, the world, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN has called it um, a, con a convention on agroecology in 2014 and 2018, and this is a the European Commission uh, also in its um, global program for. Uh, food security also has mentioned agroecology. So this can be one way of uh, addressing the problems 
standing before global food production. And in fact, I'm, um, I was, uh, I've been working on the, uh, the impact of the possibilities for Azerbaijan to uh, uh, apply agroecology. And I prepared a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So if you would like, if uh, you agree, I would like to share my screen and go over what it is, how it works and what it can, uh, what this model can actually promise. For Azerbaijan. Yeah. Also, before that, uh, I, um, you know, I, I, could you give uh, just examples like maybe Poland uh, versus India? Like, you know, some uh, are there like cases where you know one country went one way, another country went another way, and they had totally different results. Yes. Um. So, um. With regards to okay, so agri. Um, if we're talking so ag organic farming, non-chemical based farming is beneficial on many levels. Um, because Sarah, you remember, um, I remember very vividly during your presentation at Oxford, you, you mentioned the case of Poland where they took the path of, um, uh, it, it happened uh, not strategically, but you know, it was end of Soviet Union. So they, basically um you know had to take some break for their land and then they started growing it organically and it actually was brought a lot of benefits because they could sell it more expensively and you know they had some time for for for, the, for recover of the land so and it became very very profitable for poland and on the other hand you had india which used the chemical fertilizers, you know, intensively, uh, you know, um, extremely in, in big numbers. Uh, and, uh, but this did not, you know, help India much. Uh, there were low prices. There was, there was a problem with suicide of farmers in India because they just couldn't make the ends meet. So that's, that's um, uh, is this always the case or it depends? It depends how you use uh, you know, fertilizers and how, how or you use this organic farming or you should combine it. W what can you say about this? No, it's a, no organic farming means by definition farming that is without uh, that's produced without the use of synthetic um, fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides. And yes, in the case of Poland, in the post-socialist period, there were parts in Poland that um, were not able to um, that have remained uh, um, that didn't use fertilizers for some time. And later these areas were seen as strategic regions that could provide organic produce, specifically strawberries for the European Union. And then these areas did specialize in strawberry exports to the European Union countries. So um, um, having land areas that are uh, suitable for organic farming, which means that the land area should be um, free from chemical, uh, synthetic input application for several years before this um, provides a lot of advantages. It's a good point. Yes, organic produce is more expensive than produce, um, uh, may, produce to the industrial agriculture. The profit margin for the organic is higher. And um, also value added, value added um, strategies can be employed there as well. For example, organic um, fruits, nuts, and various products can be um, made into snack products, um, dehydrated and pres uh, dehydrated products preserved, and which would enhance both the value gained from this and the export opportunities. So yes, absolutely, um, organic, um, both economically and environmentally, is a better choice than industrial. But I have a question, why, why then countries and why Azerbaijan went from using, you know, for one hectare, you know, nine kilogram of fertilizers to 60 kilogram of fertilizers? Like, why, um, I mean, there must be a reason why, why farmers um, are using fertilizers. I mean, if they would have a choice that they go for organic farming and it would bring more profit, it's good for ecology, for the land, for soil. But they would do that, no? And what, what, what is standing behind using of fer chemical fertilizers? Is this only, you know, fertilizers companies, they're lobbying? Or, or is there something else, some value in it too? 
the, uh, the, the, main, the main problem standing before food production globally is soil degradation. I consider it as a chief threat to food security. It is soil degradation. So the way industrial agriculture is organized, uh, it is heavily based on monocultures, on producing. That's the way it works. A large area of land is cleared away. One type of crop is planted there. And um, usually the same type of crop is planted year after year, known as monocropping. This uh, depletes the soil. In uh, livestock uh, uh, farming, similar things, overgrazing characterizes um, farming. And um, so um, the existing methods of industrial agriculture have been associated with the speed up of um, soil degradation, which is a process we have seen in the history of agriculture throughout centuries. But what is specific about soil degradation nowadays, according to the United Nations, that today um, soil degradation is going on 30 to 35 times faster than ever in history. Soil degradation means that one or more of the chief functions of the soil are harmed. So imagine having a um, few hectares of land and they start giving less and less food. They're becoming less productive with each year. This goes on. And eventually different types of soil degradation, salinization, soil erosion, the removal of the, connected to the removal of the tree cover and eventually desertification results in loss of land suitable for agriculture. Each year, this process, soil degradation globally, is desertification specifically, is estimated to affect 1.5 billion people. So, and in the history also, this process has resulted in massive migrations. Um, I think the numbers that the World Bank provides about fertilizer use increase in Azerbaijan is indicative of um, soil degradation going on at um, alarming rate. Um, and then fertilizer companies and um, um, the input companies, they present their products as a solution. Yet uh, these products are not a solution. The problem of soil degradation cannot really be sorted out with increased fertilizer application or with increased herbicides or pesticide application. It requires a systemic approach um, an approach to agriculture that sees agriculture and farming as an extension of global uh, environment, the ecosystem, local ecosystems, whereas farming um, is seen not as something that is contrary to the way nature works, but something that can combine and use the way nature works for human benefits. So you were coming to agri we're coming to agroecology, the, the presentation, the kind of the uh, slides you wanted to show us and, and discuss a little bit this, right? Correct? Yes. Before, yes, before, yes. before you go there, I, I just want to understand and then we can come. So what is the strategy of government of Azerbaijan in agriculture now? Is it um, versus the, 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 the ideas now they will talk about, you know, agroecology, is this something Azerbaijani government is doing or is this um, basically you are recommending that this is something it should do and if it's not what it's doing, you know, what, what it is basically fertilizers, right? So our strategy is just using fertilizers. No, it's not the official strategy of Azerbaijan to use fertilizers. In fact, the latest food security document of Azerbaijan government stresses increase in organic production. This is one of the government's priority areas. But as I mentioned, agriculture in Azerbaijan is um, influenced by the economic decisions by the actors and much of it is by small and medium sized farms. And this is something that is kind of happening from bottom up. And it is indicative. So, um, our the government's official policy is to um, produce clean food. That's how it says in the in the latest program on the food security. It's the the strategy is to produce clean and organic food. The task is um, how to uh, how to how to coordinate this with the farmers and the small and medium levels. How to um, how to explain or how to discuss the possibilities of producing clean food that takes into consideration the challenges of soil degradation and can address it. 
um, I have not seen agroecology stated in the official policy documents in Azerbaijan's food security um, program and uh, related legal documents. This is why I think it is, it is my suggestion. This is why I think it's an important um, aspect and the path to discuss and to include. It is relatively recent. While the term organic has been around a lot, um, a lot earlier, um, the term agroecology is relatively recent in policy discussions. Could you then start? Could you then sorry? Could you then start using the slides then? So because we we are we have entered in the agroecology topic now, right? Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to explain what this is. It's not just organic farming. Okay, so this term is relatively recent. While the term organic has been around a lot and the general public has heard of organic. More agroecology is a relatively recent term in policy um, circles. And I have uh, found that general public is also not as informed about what it is. Um, and the term deserves attention. So what is agroecology? Agroecology is the application of the principles of ecology to food production and ecology Studies focus on the relationship between plants, animals, people, and their environments in a given locale. So agroecology is an understanding of farming, which will copy and study the way these organisms work in their natural environments and will take that knowledge and turn it, translate it into specific farming techniques and use it as a model for farming. Agroecology requires minimal or no external inputs. The whole idea behind this model of farming is to introduce um, or to reorganize food production in such a way that works as a natural ecosystem, that works as a natural ecosystem and um, these different organisms in the system, they will, um, they complement each other, the, um, the systems themselves, they become, the system itself is designed to be resilient and to self-sustain. But the techniques um, employed by agroecology are also the techniques that you will see um, in the model uh, known as disaster resilient agri agriculture. So some of the techniques that um, are used in agroecological farming are also used to uh, prepare disaster resilient uh, farming practices. And this is what is disaster resilient farming. This is the farming that can um, withstand challenges of climate change, that can withstand droughts. And I will talk about this a little bit more in the coming slides. So um, before we start, agroecology is an ecosystems approach to food production and it views food production not as something contrary to the way nature works, but it sees it as an, um, it sees nature as a, um, uh, nature as a self-sustaining, as a system that works with um, remarkable intelligence and focuses on studying the relationships in natural um, ecosystems and applying it um, to food production. Why it is so important to talk about agroecology nowadays? In our discussion before, you mentioned industrial agriculture and its effect. We talked about fertilizers. Industrial agriculture has been leading um, the global show in soil degradation. And soil degradation is a chief threat to food security. So what's happening globally is um, a decrease in the um, land area suitable for food production. And this is um, a result of industrial farming, um, clearing of the forests, also mining, but uh, industrial farming is one of the main contributors to this. Um, to put it in different terms, the way we produce food now through industrial farming makes it very difficult for our societies to ensure food tomorrow. Also to give you an analogy, imagine a man sitting on a tree branch and then cutting the branch on which the person is sitting. This is the way we are producing our food nowadays. And agroecology is 
crucial in this context because it restores soil, promotes self-sufficiency at the household level, which uh, will translate to self-sufficiency at the national level. And it's also um, economically viable. And let me show you, let me go over these in a little bit more detail. Oops. So how does industrial agriculture contribute to soil degradation? Um, so as, as I mentioned, industrial agriculture operates through monocultures. Land area is cleared and uh, usually planted with one type of crop year after year. We have uh, the nutrients being taken out of the land and not so much returned in a natural form. Um, um, this um, is supplemented by synthetic, it can be organic fertilizer as well, but this is supplemented to keep this production system going, external inputs are necessary. And uh, over the time, if these external inputs are uh, synthetic chemicals, there is the chemical contamination of the waterways, um, not even mentioning the content, nutritional content of the food items that are being produced. And um, add years and years and years of just taking and taking and taking from the land. Um, and also this, this land has been separated from its natural environment, let's say, um, and the birds and animals that have been a part of the environment, they are not, um, they are kept away with these chemicals as well. Um, the land loses its uh, ability to, uh, to uh, produce food. And soil degradation nowadays is faster than any time in history. Again, in human history, the concept is not new in human history. Soil degradation is recorded in human history, it has caused migrations in human history. But what is specific about the way it is happening nowadays is that it is 30 to 35 times faster than it has ever happened in history. And into this problem enter agroecology. It's designed with nature. So the idea is to copy the principles in nature, also known as biomimicry, to how uh, um, our food is produced. There are several parts to it. I will look at, and this system restores soils, preserves the ecosystem, promotes self-sufficiency, and uh, it is economically viable. I want to take a, a little bit of time and go over how it works. Is it effective? Is it really we're living in a world like we have a growing population to feed? Is it really, can we really um, talk about a, a farming model that is focusing on environment? Um, a short answer ahead, yes, we can. And um, is it suitable for Azerbaijan? So I just wanna take a couple of minutes and just look at each of these three questions, just cover these three questions. How it works, is it effective? Is it suitable for Azerbaijan? What do we need to um, Just to clarify, Azerbaijan doesn't have it as a strategy right now, right? It, it's not yes, ex yes, existent in Azerbaijan. Right. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Agroecology, there are many principles of agroecology. And again, agroecology is highly um, location specific. So techniques used, let's say, in a, a near Sahara Desert in Africa and the techniques used in an agroecological farm in Canada, they will not be the same. Because the key principle of this model is um, studying of the um, ecology in a given locale and applying that. And in different climatic regions, the specific techniques used will be different. But one of the things that, a few things that are common, the principles, uh, maintaining the soil cover, um, diversification, diversifying the food products produced on a small uh, plot of land, not monoculture, and minimizing external resources. Um, it may sound like fantastic, but it is, this is the type of model that is uh, pretty much operating only with what nature has. Soil cover. So agroecological, um, um, agroecological production focuses on uh, keeping the, uh, one of the models used is also agroforestry. So one of the key principles is to maintain soil cover. There are different soil cover. There are different ways this can be done. There are no, no till systems, mulch can be used, um, trees and bushes, special cover crops can be used. Agroecology, uh, if we study agroecological practices, we can see uh, the scientists and farmers using crops that are not directly food crops, but they're essential to the 
uh, maintenance of the ecosystem. And while they can't die, some of these uh, plants use can't be directly eaten, they will make the soil stronger and they will, uh, some of them may repel pests uh, as a companion planting. So, um, well, and one of the key principles here to maintain the soil cover. Mm. Diversification, so different, uh, and an understanding of how different um, um, plants, animals, birds, work together in a given locale is applied to food production. So suppose that, let's say, in a very simple example, um, we have, in industrial agriculture, we have pest problems. So suppose, suppose we have this large, large area, we're planting the same type of crop. One year, certain bugs discover it. Next year, they know that if they come to that farm, they will find exactly the same type of crop party for the bugs, right? They'll keep returning, which means there will be a need for increased pesticide application. And in agriculture, in agroecology, uh, by maintaining the trees, by keeping certain types of uh, introducing, let's say certain techniques, maybe certain types of plants that are repellent to certain insects, but also incorporating, uh, um, so suppose we have a tree and we're planting under that tree. And then the birds that come to the tree will also eat their pests that might want to attack the vegetables under the tree. So you will have, you will have this case when the system, the, the participants of the system, they will themselves work together to maintain a balance in the system. And if we are with the current industrial agriculture, if we're removing the trees, removing the uh, existing habitats and just replacing it with one type of crop and adding, trying to maintain it with adding more and more fertilizers, it doesn't have as much, besides from, it doesn't have as much uh, potential. Uh, it is, besides from being an export, uh, sorry, input extensive, input intensive, it doesn't have the same potential for uh, um, pest control as uh, this, this designing it the way nature works can have. Agroecology is also based on resource optimization. And the key part there is rainwater optimization. Agricultural farms will, um, some of them, some of the practices known in agroecology are also known as um, rain-fed agriculture. So decreasing the uh, irrigation, the, the additional irrigation needed, maximizing the rainwater. And again, there are different techniques that can be used, but maximizing storing the rainwater um, through the organization of the field. So it can be through use of swales or other techniques, uh, keeping the soil moisture levels. Um, and uh, um, this, is, this is one of the key characteristics of agroecology. We will see it in uh, rainwater, uh, uh, rainwater optimization in agroecological farm in Canada or in Africa. And this is one of the character, important characteristics. Is this, does this even work? It sounds, you may say, oh, this sounds good and nice and picture perfect. Does this even work? And the statistics may surprise you. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, um, they assess the benefit cost ratio of some of these uh, techniques that are also under agroecology that were used for disaster resilient farming. And they found the benefit cost ratio of three point seven to four point five percent what it means is that for each dollar invested the returns in uh, avoided loss or direct returns were um, 3.7 if there were ha hazard situations if there were actually droughts the returns were smaller and if in non-hazard situations the returns were 4.5 so for each dollar invested there is between 3.7 to 4.5 dollars of return in uh, avoided loss and the benefits. In Azeri, there is a nice uh, expression, we say birabesh. So the benefits from this is really literally birabesh benefits from using this type of models. And it is also as a bonus, as a fringe benefit, the model is maybe one of the, some of the UN experts say this can be the only way to address climate change. And it is uh, disaster re resilient. It, has built-in practices that are uh, suitable for dealing with the effects of uh, climate change and droughts. Outputs, can agroecology feed the world? Um, again, there was a research in 2001 um, that has uh, 
that spanned over um, 200 farms in uh, both Asia and Africa. And they have um, discovered that switching to agroecological techniques uh, resulted in an increase. It, again, the differences depends on which techniques were used and the crops. But for example, um, in the rain-fed growing of corn, they found 50 to 100% increase in productivity without adding any chemicals. So just by redesigning the way this or is organized, they found 50 to 100% increase in- uh, Sorry, 50 to 100 or 50 to 300, I see. For corn, 50 to 100. And I, saw, I say 300 because again, the numbers 50 to 300, it is the range that they discovered when they assessed the effect on different crops, on different techniques. So that is why I put it as a range here. So okay. in some other areas for some other crops, they found a 300% increase. And uh, the key thing here, without any fertilizers, a key point, without anything added, this is just, just by optimizing and copying the way nature works into food production. Um, this increases rural incomes. It's also beneficial for diets. Um, a research just recently came out in 2021 in the Journal of Food Policy uh, um, that studied agroecological farmers' diets in Ecuador, and it found that um, the farmers, uh, the farmers who are doing agroecology in Ecuador, they eat uh, more uh, varied diets, um, which is nutritionally beneficial, and they eat better diets while spending less on food. Agroecology also came by; uh, it is it is connected to improved diets of the rural population, it can also be an additional source of income uh, because of its ability to increase productivity. And now, is it suitable for Azerbaijan? And now here are some important parts. You see, agroecology requires a small farm size. And in Azerbaijan, we have already, the state has already decollectivized, decollectivized former state and collective uh, farmlands. We don't need to do any additional reforms to be able to practice this model. The land is already in individual ownership in Azerbaijan. So uh, the, the land reforms that Azerbaijan has completed by 2006 uh, provides the ground for the small farm size operation uh, of this model. So we do have that. This is a part of what we have. It also agroecology requires labor that is domestic, that has a control of land and that is invested in um, the development of this land. To put it differently, if you have a country where all the agricultural labor is migrant labor, is agroecology possible in that type of context or not? That is debatable, but in Azerbaijan, again, our rural population owns or has direct access to much of the land and uh, it is also invested by, by the virtue of this ownership. It is invested in uh, uh, increasing returns from this land and making sure that this land is sustainable. So because we do not depend on migrant labor for our agriculture, instead, we, our uh, uh, agricultural labor force is domestic, our own who, can, who owns its land. This is one of the, again, uh, uh, necessities for this model of farming. And we have that, we already have that. Policy framework, um, unlike some places, for example, in the US where uh, big agricultural companies, the um, fertilizer companies can have uh, effect on the government through lobbying and getting policies on their own. We do not have that in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's food security documents, the last one stresses the need for organic farming. So we have a policy framework that is not affected by industrial lobbying. Um, we have a government's commitment to small and medium farm, medium medium sized farms, and we have a government level commitment to organic production. So that also is a beneficial thing. But there is one caveat though. This is also a knowledge intensive model, and we do not have the country in in Azerbaijan. We do not have uh, the necessary knowledge among the farmers or even the agronomy programs that, that is necessary for contributing this model. So if Azerbaijan wants to go this road, um, and I think many people in the related in, uh, ministries or people who work with the land would agree that agronomy education in Azerbaijan needs a revision 
we do need domestic skill based, then we do need a system of education that will uh, help us to, uh, um, that, that, that looks at farming, uh, not just in terms of adding fertilizer, just looks at farming as something that is connected um, to larger ecosystem. That is something we do need to implement. That is not something that's one part um, that in Azerbaijan would need work if we were to use this model. Sarah, maybe I, I want to jump here to ask you a question because it fits so well here. Uh, you know, after the liberation of occupied territories, there are now a lot of lands uh, came back. Um, you know, it was under our jurisdiction, but it not, was not under our control. Now it is under uh, control of the government of Azerbaijan. Do you think that, um, do we have any information about the quality of the soil? Do we, do you think that, you know, because there were ideas expressed by president that, you know, Azerbaijan wants to build their smart villages, smart cities. Do you think that this is a good moment to introduce, you know, uh, agroecology in these new territories? Absolutely, I mean, yes. I think the president's suggestion for smart, smart village and smart city concept in that area, it would go very well with agroecological models of food production. And uh, they can be, um, compl they can complement each other and they can be worked into one synergistic whole. Absolutely. With regards to the quality of the soils, the research is still going on in the state soil laboratory. The top layer of the now Karabakh soils have always been very very productive. This area is productive. I think it is our duty as uh, humankind that I believe that humans are stewards of the environment, and it is important to uh, maintain and develop upon what is uh, there, and to ensure that the soils always stay like that. That uh, the gift of nature to um, that region and to human societies. It is maintained and developed and never loses the qualities that it has. So this may be, uh, this may be cr crucial. Um, this strategy may be crucial for, uh, for that purpose. And the research, again, the soil laboratory of the state is working on it. Um, the top layers of the soil are productive, but the lab tests continue with the the, the bottom ground with the, with the uh, underneath. So soon that there will be concrete data but one of the things we must do for sure is to ensure that the land in that region and everywhere uh, just improves, gets better, and um, that our use of that land does not harm the surrounding ecosystem, but builds and expands and develops. And also maybe one last question about uh, digital agriculture. Do you think, does government, um, I mean, what are good and bad sides of, of digital agriculture? And does Azerbaijani government has a strategy or plans or policies on introducing digital uh, agriculture or balancing its negative effects out? Digital agriculture is, or precision agriculture is a hype um, around the world. There is research on it and different types of robots and systems being developed that will, uh, help monitor soil health. Using also artificial intelligence, right? Yes, artificial intelligence-based models can be used, whereas information collected from the sensors on the ground level, both in livestock operations and the, and the, and the plant farming, and then the information, the data collected from the sensors is transferred to the cloud or servers, and then uh, the algorithms uh, can send solutions to what needs to be applied where on the ground. Now this model, although it provides um, real, provides opportunities for very fast assessment of what is going on, it is not the same. I would say it's even probably con even contrary to agroecology because this model is highly, again, dependent and um, not surprisingly, the companies involved in the production and development of these technologies are the same companies also that have been historically involved with the fertilizer and uh, uh, um, biotechnology development. Um, so digital agriculture uh, can sound great and can sound as if it's just like you know, science fiction plans, but digital agriculture and self-sufficiency of uh, 
individual farmer, they are at odds with each other. So an individual farmer will not be able to be truly self-sufficient and independent with <clears throat> reliance on high technology. Um, whereas with agroecology, with reliance on nature and just um, knowledge-based application of nature's design principles, uh, farmers can be self-sufficient and the food systems can be self-sufficient. Um, that is one of the big differences, social differences between the two models. Um, Azerbaijan, in as different organizations in Azerbaijan, state organizations, they have, uh, um, they have information, they are experimenting digital agriculture, but we do not have um, AI-based agriculture on a commercially significant, we don't have it large scale in Azerbaijan. And to be honest, I do hope that we, uh, as uh, we progress, we go with models that are more geared towards farmers' independence than uh, the models that are based on uh, high-tech external um, entries. But again, in digital agriculture, the, the some of the 10 sensors and the uh, technologies used in the ag digital agriculture, they are very useful as data collection tools. These sensors can be used by the state to monitor the health of the um, lands, but whether they should be used for farming at a large scale. Again, I think this model is at odds with individual farming, at odds with the farmer's ability to um, sustain themselves from the land independently. Sarah, uh, thank you so much. So you have been uh, basically advocating for uh, agroecology. You have been advocating for a careful or cautious, um, you know, critical assessment of the international experience on using digital uh, agriculture and, um, you know, raising awareness among the farmers, um, you know, about different aspects, you know, of, uh, you know, damage of, you know, chemical fertilizers versus uh, advantages of organic growth. Is there anything else you want to say at the end of our conversation in regard to, you know, um, maybe, I don't know, advice or idea uh, above, on top of all of this, um, um, you know, in, in regard to the future strategy of, uh, of the government on, um, uh, on development of agricultural sector in Azerbaijan? Um, yes, you know, I would say that the way the way we um, produce food, um, this is not and this is not something new. It's been realized and um, argued by many organizations and scientists, and our um, the awareness of that in Azerbaijan. Well, the way we are uh, producing our food, the way we are positioning ourselves economically in the world, um, there are different paths. There can be different paths to the same. Uh, um, to the same, let's say, suppose if we want a family can achieve a hundred, uh, for just for the sake of example, let's say a family, a royal family can achieve a hundred dollars a month this way or that way, but which way we choose to go, that can have significant implications about the futures and how far we are able to go. So I think it is very important for us to realize that um, the decisions made about rural development in uh, Azerbaijan, they're not just economic decisions, but they really at their heart, their decisions do involve understanding of land, food, and people. This is, uh, I think, the best, the best way to see it. And then economistic terminology dominates in international usually discussions of um, development, but an understanding that is based on that sees development as something that adds value to people's life, not always in the monetary forms, but in the broader understanding. That is what uh, can and will take us farther and inshallah in the uh, going farther and stronger. That's what I wanted to add. That's it. Sarah, thank you very much uh, for your thoughts, for your ideas and for the slides you have provided for this interview. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you for being on our show. Thank you very much for doing this and all the best. Thank you.